Okay. We have limited time and we want to make sure that we get everyone's questions in, which we have on the agenda. Thank you so much, everyone. This is our second call. Let me introduce myself real briefly in our committee. I'm June Taylor. I'm chair of the Economic Development Committee, but I don't do it alone. I have um, the committee here, which is comprised of Eric Sinnenberg and Alec Isaacson. They are both here on the call, but this would not be possible without help and support from um, the city of Beachwood. Mayor Martin Horowitz is on the call here and the team here from our Economic Development Department. And I'd like to turn it over to the mayor to welcome everyone right away. Mayor, please. I, I really do appreciate what you're putting forth, June, and getting everyone together. This is now the second meeting. And I think there was a tremendous amount of good information that came out of the first meeting. I think it's all helpful to our small business owners. Um, I especially want to thank Michelle Gilchrist, who I'm looking for here and can't quite see her. But um, I, I'm not on. I'm not. I don't do uh, cameras. So oh, I'm on cameras? the phone only. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. People tell me I have a face for phone only too. Um, so. For those of you who don't know Michelle's connection to all this, I'm I'm not sure either. But it, she she is amazing at giving us information stemming from the governor. Um, I I, I want to thank you personally. Just take a minute to thank you personally. Um, and and you know I've thanked you in emails, but it is a very hard job following day to day what's going on. And we we truly respect what Governor DeWine and Dr. Acton are doing. And I think we all feel it's a very nice, professional, scientific response. Um, but whenever we have a question, if an order is not clear or how it would be interpreted, we look to Michelle and she very quickly gets us information. Um, she's also been distributing summaries of the mayor's press conferences, of the governor's press conferences, and some very excellent fact sheets from Ohio Department of Health. Um, a number of them we've distributed to our residents. I sent June and Carrie uh, the one on small business today, and we're going to put that up on our website. Um, so thank you, Michelle. Thank you for, for everything. Oh, you're, you're most welcome. It's, it's tremendously, tremendously appreciated. And uh, thank you so our other much. speaker, we also thank you because uh, so much of this depends on SBA and, and your involvement. So thank you for being here today. Mayor, thank you so much for the comments. Sure. Um, let me say that um, we have two speakers today. Michelle Gilcrest is here from the governor's office. We also have Raymond Graves, who is here from the SBA. Uh, because uh, we both of our speakers have a limited amount of time, uh, we're going to let uh, Michelle speak first. And um, I'm going to ask everyone, please, to put your um, uh, telephone as well as your computers on mute, please, so we can limit the background noise. And um, since the mayor has done a wonderful introduction of um, Michelle, and I'll just add that she is definitely uh, the governor's eyes and ears in northeastern, um, in northeastern Ohio, uh, I'm going to let Michelle have the floor now, or the microphone, I'd rather and uh, go ahead and start. And then um, I think, Michelle, you also have some of the questions I've already emailed you uh, that students have emailed in and then we'll, we'll take it from there, okay? Okay, June, can you hear me? Yes, June? thank you. Okay, okay, I just wanted to make sure you could hear me. Okay, so I will go over a few things that try to address some of the pressing issues that are out there uh, at this point. But before I got started, I wanted to uh, personally thank June for agreeing to serve on the governor's new minority health uh, strike force that was just recently uh, formed as a result of looking at the numbers of individuals who have been negatively impacted health-wise from the uh, coronavirus 
and those numbers are skewing unfavorably, especially to our minority uh, community. So thank you, June, for agreeing to uh, serve on that strike force. Uh, and then now I want to get into uh, the CARES Act, which is a federal piece of legislation. And this is the third phase of the federal stimulus relief. I know that there was a question about uh, getting resources down to the local government to help with uh, loss tax revenue and sales tax revenue and income tax revenue and other uh, resources as a result of this uh, pandemic. So let me explain what the CARES Act is going to do for Ohio as we currently understand it. Uh, this phase three of the CARES Act is going to allocate $4.5 billion to Ohio. Of that amount, 45% of it, or $2 billion, can be allocated directly by the U.S. Treasury to local governments that are over 500,000 individuals in population. So what this means is that the city of Columbus and five counties in Ohio, Franklin, Cuyahoga, Summit, Hamilton, and Montgomery are going to get money directly sent to them from the U.S. Treasury. And based upon estimates that uh, are being used from the latest census data, and a formula that was put into the CARES Act, it looks like between 750 and $800 million are going to be directly allocated to these jurisdictions. And my understanding is, is that Cuyahoga County, as a county, did apply for this funding. So now we're getting more, now we're going to get into the sticky part of this. So that remaining portion of that local 45%, which is $1.2 billion, would go to the state of Ohio for disbursement. We at the state level have been in constant phone calls with the Department of Treasury We've been talking with both Senators uh, Brown and Portman, and we just last night got some new guidance on how the state is going to be able to distribute those funds to local governments. So right now, the governor's director of the Office of Budget uh, Management, Kim Murnick, is going through that latest guidance with her team to see how we can get those funds down to local communities such as Beechwood. Now, the other sticky part of this is if Cuyahoga County is receiving money on its own from the U.S. Treasury, are they too somehow going to share their portion of these funds with local governments in that county. And at this point, it seems like that has yet to be determined. And let me tell you what those funds can be used for. So those funds can be used to pay for necessary expenditures that were incurred due to the public health emergency with respect to coronavirus. Um, that, what we have been told by Treasury is, we cannot use those funds to cover lost revenue. So if the state were to give money to Beechwood, we're still trying to determine if we can just give that money directly to you if it has to be done or if it has to be done in a different way but we 
but you cannot use that money to backfill lost revenue as a result of coronavirus. It has to be used for expenses that are related to coronavirus itself. So that's one of the points that I wanted to talk about. Um, the other uh, issue that I wanted to bring up is that uh, local government taxing districts such as counties, cities, townships, and schools are going to be receiving from the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation uh, checks that will be mailed out over the next five days uh, that will um, that are from dividends that the Bureau would have kept, but instead they are going to be mailed out to uh, uh, govern local governmental taxing districts. So if Beachwood is considered a local government taxing district, you should see some type of uh, check in the mail to you. I'm being told that the dividend equals approximately 100% of the premiums that you paid in policy year 2018. Um, I would encourage you to all watch today's uh, press conference by the governor. Um, I know I typically watch it at 2 p.m. on the ohiochannel.org. Today, the governor will have on there an environmental engineer who is part of the team that is working on the reopening plan, and he is going to do a great job explaining um, the different precautionary measures that businesses, governments, and other entities will, that, will, that will have to be taken in order to reopen and why certain businesses will be allowed to reopen in the first phase as opposed to other businesses that won't be allowed to reopen until later phases due to the health concerns, um, how well you can disinfect um, the, um, the, uh, the way the uh, square footage of particularly a certain types of businesses, how crowds usually gather in those types of businesses. So it will be a very informative, scientific-based um, rolling out plan to try to get the economy moving, but making sure that we're trying to keep everyone safe at the same uh, time. Um, I'm sure that you also heard that schools will be continuing to function remotely for the remainder of this year and will not uh, uh, reopen. Um, no decision has been made on schools uh, for the fall as of yet. I know there was a question asking about recreation centers and pools and things like that. I think that as this rollout plan uh, gets announced, uh, I believe Monday of next week, you will see some answers to those questions. Um, my thought is, is that a recreation center, a gym, would probably have more um, control over how many people are allowed in uh, how many people are allowed on equipment, maybe you space people every third uh, treadmill, every second machine. But in terms of outdoor pools with kids gathering and things like that, um, I suspect that that may come further down the line in terms of our rollout announcement. Um, I have no nothing factual telling me that, but just based upon the um, request that everybody wear masks and things like that when they're out, you know, in public or at stores and things like that, I think it's going to be more difficult to have an outdoor pool open 
um, you know, early in the summer season than it is for a traditional rec center. Um, and then the last thing I want to share with everybody, in case you missed the announcement yesterday, is that we have been able to get F FDA approval on a new testing reagent. And because these reagents have been extremely limited, Ohio and other states have had very limited testing capacity. The governor spoke with officials at the FDA on Sunday and was able to get approval as of yesterday for a new version of the reagent for a specific company's testing machines which those machines are used by most of the major labs in Ohio. So in the next couple of weeks, you are gonna see in Ohio, the numbers for testing go up uh, dramatically. We are still working on trying to secure the antibody testings, which will help us also enable, enable people to say, I've had the coronavirus strain. I probably now have immunity to it for some length of time, which should then allow you to feel more comfortable once things start to open, you know, to go to certain places and particip participate in certain activities. Um, Again, I would encourage you all, it is updated every day with new information to go to the state's website, coronavirus.ohio.gov. And I think that is all I had, June, at this point. Michelle, thank you so much for that overview. Uh, Mayor, do you... Do you do you have a response? Okay. No, uh, I just, I'd like the, to only, the only thing I would point out, I mean, Michelle is accurate on the BWC. Um, for Beachwood, we are self-insured, so we actually do not get a refund on anything. Okay, okay. Uh, but, but other cities that are state-funded would, would certainly get, what is it, a million six or so, something, or billion six. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to just find those little pieces and pots to help, you know, make a difference in some way that we can. And, and that, that will make a difference to a lot of cities with, um, with state funded workers comp. Um, we just went a different route as some larger employers do. Um, but we're thinking of coming back. So. Okay. okay. We might be back with you. Okay. And Michelle, that was very helpful as we have received a lot of questions from our citizens regarding our community assets uh, as it relates to summertime and a lot of parents uh, wanting to uh, participate in a lot of our um, activities that we have here. So thank you so and, and much for giving. And in, and in you, as I didn't mean to interrupt, but in you saying that, um, I know that the group that is looking at the rollout is also looking at day camps and summer camps and things like that, especially for parents who might be part of the new businesses that will be going back to work, especially if they have to physically go back to work on how, you know, what, what then can they do with children who are still at home because schools are not in session. That's right. That's right. So we will be anxiously looking to uh, get direction from them, but you've given us some um, very good indicators, at least with regard to water. Um, Michelle, from a yes. time perspective, yes. uh, you have, from a time perspective, Michelle, you have about four more minutes. Can you can can you take any more questions, Michelle? Yes. Yes. The microphone is open. Citizens, are there any more questions for Michelle? Go ahead, please. I have a, I have a question, June and Michelle. Hi, it's Tammy Schneider. Sure. Um, I own uh, Cleveland Yoga Studios here and one studio in Beachwood and another couple out in the areas. 
And I know that there's been guidelines for fitness centers, um, but what about uh, areas where we're doing group fitness together, where there's no equipment? Is, are there guidelines for um, square footage? Like I know the six foot distance rule, um, for example, my studio space is 1400 square feet. What is there, are there some sort of guidelines that uh, we're offering for those types of businesses? So what I would say is, and I know everybody is anxious to get this information, the way this has been explained to me is, is that when this new information comes out on Monday, there's not gonna be anything um, regarded anymore as an essential and non-essential business. That this will be in columns and phases and that you will be able to find yourself in that column and it will give all of the guidance uh, for you. And it's probably going to break it down into, um, you know, no, no more than X number of people within a certain amount of square footage. Um, so what I would just ask you to do, I know people want to plan and everything, but Monday is when I am expecting all of that information to, uh, to come out. Um, the other thing that we're telling people that are currently considered an essential business is that even though you're operating now under certain guidelines, you will still need to comply with new guidelines that may be put upon your uh, current industry type. So that will all be coming out on uh, Monday. Okay. Let me, so uh, I, I, know, I know in the current stay at home order, they've got those safety requirements with the six foot distancing, you know, the hand sanitizers, the, the different things like that. So mm -hmm. I suspect it's gonna be mm -hmm. that plus more things. And recognize that all of these guidelines are being developed not by just the governor. At, sitting at the table is the Department of Health, other members of the health and medical community, but also folks from industry. So when we're talking about like health and fitness and things like that, um, you know, we have people there. Uh, that are representative, hopefully, of all the different health and fitness types of activities, or they're consulting with owners of those types of establishments. Mm -hmm. okay. So we're trying not to make these decisions in a vacuum. Okay. Okay. Yeah, big question is, uh, you know, will people need to be wearing masks when they're exercising? You know, so... Um, I and I don't I'm a runner so I don't know because I also wear glasses and that creates a bit of an issue when you're breathing that heavily and you can't see <laughs> so I understand um, let me do this um, let me give you my email address okay and as questions arise feel free to email me I try to return the emails in 24 hours, but there are some days that I just can't get to them until, you know, 36 or 48 hours. So my email, my email uh, for everybody is Michelle, and that's M-I-C-H-E-L-L-E -L -L -E dot, and I will spell the last name. It's G as in George, I, L L C R I S T the at symbol governor dot Ohio dot G O V and governor and Ohio are completely spelled out. Can, you just, can I ask one more question? Yes. Or Michelle. Um, yes. I, I'm already getting calls from residents saying, well, how are you going to, 
you know, if a restaurant opens up and 50% of the, of the tables uh, are only allowed to be occupied, what, you know, what are you going to do to enforce it? So when these guidelines come out, are they going to be, do you know if they're going to be health orders from Dr. Acton? Will there be some element of they're gonna be, ability? Yeah, my, my understanding is they will be health orders from Dr. Acton. Um, the way that this is going to have to be um, enforced is that if I walk into that restaurant and I see that they are not distancing the way they are supposed to, that they're not wearing the mask and taking the necessary precautions, then I as a customer or I as an employee that work there, um, you know, will call that local health department to report that. And, you know, I as a customer will probably utilize um, social media and other methods to inform people that this restaurant is not, you know, following the rules. And I think most places want to follow the rules. And I think that if they're going to want customers to come in and feel comfortable, they're going to have to follow the rules. Okay, thanks. Uh, if I could, if, if I could add a couple of things and mention a couple of things that need to be clarified as the mayor Mayor made a very interesting question. You know, it's it's one thing for the state of Ohio to create these guidelines. The other thing is how do they how do they get um, officiated? How do they get orchestrated? How do they how do they um, uh, where's the oversight from the requirements that have to come now down? I would assume down to the city level. Um, I can tell you that um, over the last couple of days, and you may have heard it, you may have read it, um, that there was going to be, for example, uh, and the May and the even the president mentioned it that oh, we're going to have an opening of a mall called Nebraska Crossings in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and and I can tell you that um, I know the mall because I happened to have designed it years ago. But the fact of the matter is. It was a disaster with the way this individual owner, he's a single person, was going to open this project tomorrow. And um, ICSC, which is International Organization of Shopping Centers, um, has now asked several people, including myself, on guidelines on what should be put in place um, for when these shopping centers should open. In this case, whether they were open area shopping centers or enclosed shopping centers. And the issue had very much come down to the local level. And fortunately, it was between ICSC and the local health official, they were able to change the opening for the mall. It's not opening tomorrow. It's a soft opening. There's going to be no customers, supposedly. But the question that I raise is, how does that become officiated and the dollars that it takes to then manage that from a local level and starting to do the planning. Let's say, for example, in our community, we have Beechwood Place and they intend to open in four weeks. Well, what are going to be those guidelines? How are those things going to be, how are those things going to be orchestrated? And I don't think that can happen on the state level. Um, it can be talked about the guidelines from the governor's viewpoint and from Dr. Atkin, but it's going to be, become a major planning exercise that needs to be orchestrated, in this case, between the city and fortunately our mall is owned by a, in Beecher Place, is owned by a large development company. But let's talk about for a moment all the office buildings that we have in Beecher, where we have multiple tenants. How is that going to be orchestrated? They haven't talked about those kind of details at any of these sessions that I've heard. I'm retired, but I'm looking out for our Beechwood residents and for our, and for, and, and for our Beechwood associates and workers that come to work every day. And when you go to an office building that is a multi-tenant office building, how does that get orchestrated and how do the people 
whether the residents or non-residents feel comfortable coming into an office building. And let's just say for one example, we have two buildings called Signature Square. They have multiple tenants in that building. How does one feel safe going there? There's an optical. How does a, how does a resident feel comfortable walking into the building and what do they have to do to go through? And I think that there needs to be outlines. And that, for, that's, yeah, and that's going to all be outlined on Monday. And once those outlines are shared, recognize that a lot of these places are not going to be able to open in this first phase. There's going to be multiple phases. And this is all going to have to also be coordinated with the county health department your city and some I know some cities have their own health department but you know they're all going to have to be working together on this right and 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 at, at this time Michelle I know you have to go to your to your next meeting yes so, thank you yes thank you so much Michelle oh, 1 30 yep thank you so yes. much June <laughs> okay and please and you know if anybody has any questions or concerns don't hesitate to uh, send me an email okay Michelle thank you so much and all of our citizens thank you our mayor thanks you and we'll be in touch okay okay thank you June take care you're, everyone you're welcome you're welcome all right bye bye all right, our next guest, um, and let me um, move on to our next guest because I know that everyone wants to talk about our, our favorite subject, which is, which is money. We have uh, two guests uh, that have been able to, um, to join us. Um, we have um, uh, Raymond Graves, who's yeah. joined us. Uh, mm -hmm. Raymond is a lender relations um, specialist yes, yes. with the Small Business Association. Remind, I just need to remind everyone, please, uh, mute your uh, microphone, please, if you're taking other calls. Um, James, please mute yeah, your microphone, you please, okay, because I can hear all your background noise there. And um, Raymond's yeah. been on the line here. He yeah. is with the Thank SBA. You. And one of the things that he has Thank been you. able to do uh, very well is um, he works with lenders to encourage them to extend credit to small businesses and show them how um, SBA products can be helpful to mitigate risk and make lending into uh, this segment uh, more profitable to them. Um, we also have um, on the line with us today, um, we also have Tom Frazier. Tom, are you on the line? Tom, are you there? June, I, can you, hi June, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Tom is great, CEO. Yeah. Great, thank you Tom for joining us as well. Tom is CEO of the First Mutual Holding Company, which includes First Federal of Lakewood, and he's also vice chair of the Ohio Bankers League. And um, Tom, thank you so much for joining us as well. I wanted um, all of our citizens here in Beachwood to have two perspectives. And um, this is very important because we received a lot of e emails. The committee received a lot of emails um, about not only the SBA process, but also trying to understand for individuals that do not have bank relationships, how they might be able to navigate the process. So our committee wanted to be able to give um, the, a, a breadth of really knowledge from both perspectives. So I will be quiet now and allow Ray to talk from an SBA perspective and Tom, and then let you guys ask the questions. Ray, Please take the microphone. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Hopefully you can hear me okay. This is Ray Graves from uh, USSBA Cleveland District Office. Um, you know, I think a lot of people have already had the opportunity to, to investigate uh, the SBA's response to the COVID crisis. So I'll, I'll just provide a little bit of, uh, you know, sort of brief background um, because <laughs> so from time to time I do meet some folks who who do have some misinformation about the programs. And so I'll just sort of talk off the cuff about, about three of them, and uh, then let's, let's get to the questions. I'm sure there are, there are quite a few. Um, sort of uh, the first response SBA had was the uh, Economic Injury Disaster Loan Product, um, EIDL, also called EIDL. 
And that was what we had sort of off the shelf when this uh, crisis began. Um, the economic injury disaster loan is, is what uh, has been available for, for years when there's a crisis. We have physical disaster loans and these economic injury ones. The economic injury disaster loan is something that you apply for directly from the SBA. Um, it goes through uh, SBA's website, sba.gov slash disaster. Um, that was uh, put in place very early. I think uh, Indiana had it before we did, but we were one of the, the first states in the industrial Midwest to, uh, to have access to that. Um, you know, my understanding is that uh, millions of people applied through that, and uh, that program has become very heavily oversubscribed. But what it's designed to do is to help a business get from one side of a crisis to another. So think of it in terms of like, you know, 12 months of working capital for things like rent and payroll and so on. And the, the benefit is that you get 30 years to pay the, the thing back at a rate of interest that's pretty decent. Uh, I think the rate of, rate of interest for a business was 3.75% and uh, the time period to pay it back is, is 30 years. And typically if you've got a working capital loan, uh, you know, it's going to be repaid over five or seven years. So 30 years to repay a working capital loan is, is a pretty decent amortization, lets those payments be uh, made pretty, pretty simply. Those loans uh, would go up to $2 million. And then through the CARES Act, we changed that a little bit and said, hey, we're going to change it so that you can actually get an advance on the loan, which is going to be a grant. Uh, and that's going to be... Um, delivered to you expeditiously um, and you know it's a relatively small portion but at least we would get cash out in the hands of small businesses pretty quickly um, so that was the idle advance grant uh, doesn't need to be paid back at all uh, so after idle we did a couple more things uh, one was SBA debt relief so folks who have an SBA loan or get a new conventional or sort of typical I guess I should say SBA loan are going to have their debt payments paid by the government for six months. So that's going to be pretty nice. Uh, a lot of debt relief through that. Um, so if you already have an SBA loan uh, with a bank, you should be in, in, in contact with your bank to make sure that uh, uh, you're on the same page with uh, not making payments for the next six months and letting the, the government do that for you. And the third thing we, put, we brought online was this thing called the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP. What that's designed to do is to uh, allow businesses to rehire their employees and the SBA uh, would essentially pay off those loans um, for uh, that that borrower if they uh, adhere to certain requirements. Now, unlike the idle program, the PPP is one that is uh, engaging the private lending community. So rather than going to the SBA's website for one of these PPPs, you actually go to a local lender and you apply through them. They make a loan, the SBA guarantees 100% of the thing, and then uh, eight weeks after you get your loan, uh, assuming you adhere to the requirements, you can get the entire amount forgiven. So that's pretty nice because it allows a small business to rehire the people and the government's foot in the bill for the employees. Does it solve for the case where a business has no revenue? Uh, well, no. You know, If you're not allowed to be open, and uh, you, know, you don't have any revenue coming in, bringing your employees back to work doesn't necessarily help you much, right? Um, but if you're the kind of business that can be open, but you're, having, you're struggling and you're not, your revenue isn't what it was, it can keep your people employed, right? And there are certain circumstances where an employer becomes aware that their employees aren't able to get unemployment for some reason, and they care about those employees, so they want to you know, keep them on, on payroll. This allows them to do, do that for an eight week period. Um, so it's a nice program. Folks are really interested in it because of that forgiveness aspect. If they do the right things with the money, it's, it's forgiven. Um, but if there's a stub left over, uh, if that is to say, if not all the amount is forgiven, then that, that company has the next uh, 18 months or so to uh, pay off that remaining unforgiven amount at a rate of 1% interest. So it's, it's very affordable. The amount of a PPP, like the amount of the loan itself, which you're, you're requesting up front, is itself based on two and a half months of last year's payroll. So it is in and of itself, it's, it's supposed to be delimited by two and a half months of payroll expense from, from last year, so during your sort of typical time period. So it is itself, just like IDLE, a working capital program designed to replace expenses, not designed to grant business owners their sales or profitability. 
there's a slight distinction there. Hopefully that provides a little bit of uh, sort of um, framework around these, these three programs. Um, the EIDL program uh, directly from the government, the debt relief program designed to ease the pain of, uh, of current SBA debts that, that folks have, and then finally this PPP program, which is engaging private lenders to deliver access to capital to folks who need it. That, that was great, that was great. Um, I think that um, it might be good to have Tom uh, interject at this time, or would you, citizens, would you like to ask any questions regarding the programs? How about that? So, so June, I'd be glad to amplify uh, Ray's comments in particular sure. about uh, the Paycheck Protection Program, if that would sure. be okay. And okay. that might, that might um, anticipate a few of the questions that I'm sure are on all of our small business minds yes. here. Um, and I'll take just about a moment. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me. So on, on short notice, and thank you, Mayor, for your leadership uh, within the Beechwood community through, um, through this uh, crisis. And Ray, I, you and I haven't had a chance to talk since this uh, started, but on behalf of my team, thanks for your local office's responsiveness to all the banks that are headquartered here in Northeast Ohio. So I know you've worked Herculean hours uh, to, to, to get this stood up. Um, so this is, uh, I'll give, share with you a, a, a small bank's perspective. Maybe I can also offer some perspective for those who are uh, in the queue um, and waiting for funding from some of the larger banks uh, as well. Um, and, and to uh, also provide with you an update on some facts, which you may already be aware of. Uh, the EIDL program has been uh, topped off, or it's in the process of being topped off, I should say. It's, I'm watching on C-SPAN right now. The House is taking up um, the measure right now. I'm hoping in the next hour or two, both the additional funding for EIDL, which I think is 10, an additional 10 billion, Ray, I might be wrong, for, uh, for businesses for EIDL, and then another 50 billion or so for uh, agriculture and some others who might have been impacted. Um, and then as far as PPP goes, uh, approximately another 310 billion in addition to the 349 that was originally allocated. And this has been tranched off into a big bank bucket, a mid-sized bank bucket and a small bank bucket as well so that the funds get allocated uh, efficiently in this next round. So um, it may not feel great uh, having gone through this process as a small business and certainly as a bank that, and we're a mutual bank, that means we're owned by our by our depositors in our community. Uh, it's been hard to get this stood up just because of the urgency in which this has rolled out, but I also know if you're waiting for your funding, uh, there's not enough time uh, in the world to get it to you, so I truly appreciate that. Uh, I just have a couple of perspectives and a couple of maybe tips as uh, we're waiting for this funding to come in. So it's my understanding uh, that if this gets passed today, that uh, the Office of Management and Budget and the SBA uh, would need about a day or so to process the new law, which looks substantially similar to the existing law, uh, to get it stood up. And uh, it's not clear yet when uh, new apps can go in under this, but the best guess would be within 24 hours, but it may take a few days beyond that. So that's just a little bit of perspective on, on timing. A few things I wanted to share with you are some tips, depending on where you are in the process. Um, and so let me share those with you. Uh, if you've received a notice from your bank uh, that your loan was previously approved in round one and you have an SBA loan number from your lender, uh, you can expect to have your loan documented and, fundlet, I'm sorry, and funded regardless of the release of this additional round of funding. So consider yourself safe. Just be patient. Let the process work itself out. There's a fair number of operational things with Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering to get the funds out. But it's my understanding, at least in the case of my bank, if you've been funded, I'm sorry, if you've been approved, we funded about 94% of those. And I would anticipate that the rest of those would be out in the next day or two. And talking with some of my larger bank peers, uh, that's kind of a similar, a similar rhythm. They may not be quite as far along because just because of the operational uh, nature of it, but within the next few days, you should get funded. Uh, if your loan application, I apologize for the background sirens. I'm, my office is down the street from uh, uh, the hospital here in the fire department. So just bear with the, uh, 
the background noise for a moment. Uh, so if your loan application is in uh, the round two queue with your lender and you have all of your documentation in, but it hasn't been approved yet, just confirm with your bank that you're in the queue and that you know your status. Uh, we can't submit your application into the SBA system until it's been reviewed by your bank and the portal from SBA is open for round two, which would be in the next uh, 24 hours to a couple of days. Uh, so check with your bank. Uh, if your application was submitted, another scenario here, but you haven't heard from your bank, uh, try to reach out directly to your bank to secure a status update. Um, and if you're, if you're considering applying in round two, um, reach out to your current bank to talk about the fastest path forward. So it may be difficult to get in the queue right now or feel comfortable, uh, but you might want to check with your bank's website to understand the documents uh, that you would need to have required to submit along with your application. I know many of the bigger uh, C-Corps, bigger meaning fitting the definition of the program, uh, companies that had CFOs that had professional accounting staff, it was e relatively easy for them to get the documentation in. I fully understand uh, the, the plight of a sole proprietor, um, that's many of our customers, uh, or a subchapter S corporation, uh, who did, with a person who does it all on behalf of their five or six employees, how difficult it is to get that information organized. Um, but uh, the requirements are roughly the same for both uh, uh, small sole proprietors and larger uh, small businesses as well. If you need help, check with your banker. Um, and if you don't have a bank, or your bank is not an approved SBA lender, it is a bit lit, late in the game to get in the queues, uh, but I'd be glad personally to help you find um, a lender who could help you, uh, including my company or uh, a few of our smaller affiliates that we have. So our company's organized that we're uh, uh, a collection of five different mutual banks that work collectively. Um, and so we have a little bit of capacity. So if you're stuck um, in the sense that you don't have a lending relationship, uh, we'd be glad to help at this point. No promises because the queue is a little long, but I'd be glad to, to offer my, my help to get you in the right direction. My final comment is if you're already working with the bank and you're in somebody's queue, that's going to be your best spot to be in right now uh, because you're, it may not feel great. It may uh, feel like you're in a line where you can't see the end of it, uh, but you're going to be in a better spot than you might be elsewhere. A reason for optimism in, at this late hour is uh, because of the efforts of our local offices, because of Ray Graves, because of Congressman Shabbat in Cincinnati, um, and Congressman, uh, I'm sorry, Congresswoman Beatty in Columbus on both sides of the aisle who have influence on House Financial Services. Uh, the Ohio banks were a little bit better positioned to participate in PPP, and they took great care to make sure mountains were moved at the Ohio banks. Uh, all over the state were able to participate. I know that rings hollow if you haven't been funded yet, uh, but I could tell you based on expected payrolls in Ohio, Ohio punched way above its weight. And I wanna say, Ray, you probably have better statistics. Maybe 70% of our uh, businesses have been funded at this point, or at least the dollars have been funded. That may not be proportionate to the actual numbers of, of businesses, but uh, we fared much better than other states in this process. I wanna say we're fifth or sixth uh, overall in the country on that percentage basis. So I'll stop there and would be glad to answer questions about how the banks are operationalizing this and to offer my assistance in any way. Great, I'd like to open the microphones to citizens for questions and I know Alec Isaacson um, why don't you start with the chat room question I know that we received, please. Sorry, give me a second to unmute, I'm here. Um, so we've got, I think the question was partially answered. We've got um, uh, somebody who's asking um, if they can still apply for funding, if any of the, which of the programs still have availability in them and then where one might go to get info on how to apply. Uh, so I'll take a first crack at that. Um, unfortunately, IDLE and PPP are out of funding right now. 
The uh, idle application process is through sba.gov slash disaster. Um, unfortunately, that portal is down right now, as far as I know, because we don't have funding for it. So we, we took that one down. Um, you know, Tom was saying his best guess was 24 to 72 hours after uh, law signing, we would uh, have some PPP availability again. Again, our internal portals on that are also shut down. So folks can't, uh, you know, banks can't submit applications in. Um, SBA is not keeping a queue. Uh, if there's any queues being kept, it would be, you know, at the lending institutions if, if they're doing that. Some are, some are not. Um, uh, as far as information on how to apply, uh, your local small business development center uh, could be helpful. You certainly should be getting in touch with, with your favorite lender and getting their application uh, process, getting their application materials uh, request for a PPP uh, so that you can you know, get your, your documents to them if they are accepting them. The uh, SBA debt relief is a separate part of uh, appropriation, so that, that is still up. Got it. Thank you very much. Great. And, and, and just to build on uh, Ray's uh, response. So um, raising the spot where he can't comment necessarily about the likelihood of appropriations being granted uh, because um, he can only respond to what's in the law. So I'll build on that just a bit. Uh, so assuming the House takes, they, they are taking the measure up right now to offer additional funding. Once that funding's there, it will take a few days possibly to get that uh, ready for PPP. Uh, there are resources, I believe, on SBA site as to who are approved 7A lenders. Uh, I think it would be an extraordinary assumption that almost all of them are um, uh, par participating in PPP, so I would check there as well or contact your bank. Or if you're not quite sure where to go, um, if you work through um, uh, June here on this call, or I'll give out, better yet, my email directly so I could try to get you pointed in the right direction. Uh, my email is uh, T like Thomas, F like Frank, R like Rainbow, I want to be optimistic, uh, A like Apple, S Sam, uh, E like Echo, and R like Roger, so that's T Fraser, at FFL.net, like Frank, Frank, Larry.net. So uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. I can't promise you it'll be the answer you want, but I'll do my best to get you pointed in the right direction. Uh, and in your particular case, I might we our company might be able to help. Thank you so much. And and this is June Taylor. What we'll do is we'll make sure that our economic development uh, team has all the contact information that at, that our speakers provide today. It'll be at the city as well. So so if anyone wants to obtain contact information, we'll have that too. Next question. Hi, this is Koshik, Koshik Goshal. Um, thanks everyone for organizing this. This is very helpful. And, and Ray, good to hear your voice again. Um, uh, a question for you regarding eligibility for the loan to be converted into grant. I'm talking about PPP program per se. Uh, it's 2.5 times your monthly payroll cost. Uh, do you have to show um, that is paid out in two months or into an a 2.5 months payroll cost that is you have to like you know pay that out plus other costs in two months or you can have it paid in two and a half months to employees and qualify for it to be converted or at least considered to be converted to a grant thanks uh, so the question sort of relates to the forgiveness uh, calculation on the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, we are, uh, it's been said many times, uh, flying this airplane and building the airplane at the exact same time. And that's cold comfort to folks who are trying right now to figure out, um, having been told by their lender, we need to close um, your PPP. Um, gee, you know, what exactly are the exact terms of forgiveness, especially if I am going to have trouble bringing back employees? Uh, the two and a half times uh, that Koshik just mentioned is it, it's it's relevant to the amount of the PPP loan that you'll be calculated. The maximum amount of a PPP loan is generally going to be two and a half times your average monthly payroll from from last year. So you know that could be whatever it is, hundred thousand dollars. The forgiveness on a PPP loan is determined eight weeks after your first disbursement. 
And the amount of the forgiveness is dependent uh, on a couple of things. One is maintaining employee headcounts and employee compensation levels, uh, and also making sure that you're using uh, at least 75% of your proceeds on uh, payroll. Uh, so you're limited in, in terms of what else you can use it on. But a business that uh, hires people back, uh, that tries to maintain uh, headcounts and payroll, and uses their, their PPP on uh, at least 75% of it on, on payroll, should be pretty confident they're going to get the entire amount forgiven. There are so many different scenarios and different um, things that could happen that uh, I, I admit that's a little bit general, um, but the rules from the SBA on exactly how that forgiveness is going to work in every scenario it just haven't been written yet or haven't been published yet. I know teams are working on that, uh, but we're trying to get things done one thing at a time. And uh, that is the best answer I've got for you. I hope that's that's helpful. Maybe Tom can actually speculate more, but it's that's what I got. Uh, thank you. That's very helpful. Right. I think no. I think Ray, you uh, summarized that pretty well. And I would just suggest another twenty-five percent. You use it for business uh, related purposes, such as uh, mortgage payments, rent payments, uh, utilities. Uh, if you talk to your lender or if you go to the SBA site, uh, it, it'll describe uh, the other uses beyond that 75% for, uh, for payroll. And just to build on that, um, the, the act is pretty clear that interest on debt is, is eligible, but not the actual payment. Um, I just want to make sure you agree with that. Yep. Thank, yep, thank you for that, that clarification, Ray. You're right. So. Yeah, it, it's 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 clear that it's like designed not to help a business owner sort of like build equity, but help them sort of uh, tread water, I guess, would be the thing, you know, utilities and uh, interest on debt and, and, you know, rent payments, that sort of thing. Um, the, the important thing is, you know, folks uh, in the lending community and in the uh, small business community aren't clear on, on exactly what can be paid with the, these proceeds. And the way the rules and act is written is it should be uh, expenses incurred and amounts paid within the eight week period after your loan closes. So uh, business owners have asked me, well, you know, can I, can I pay uh, debts that I'm, I'm, you know, I owe from before the eight week period. Uh, and I would say, you know, it's, it's not completely clear, but a conservative reading of the act is that you cannot, it should be things incurred during that eight week period and paid during that eight week period. Um, so bear that in mind. Well, that's good. And one other one other resource on the SBA site and the Treasury, and I believe it in a similar uh, way on the Treasury site, uh, is there's useful uh, Q and A's and FAQs that are published uh, four to five times a week. It seems uh, as the program changes and as final rules and regulations are promulgated under the law, uh, they're published to the Federal Register, and. Uh, and the appropriate agency websites, SBA and Treasury, have done a good job of communicating those, uh, but uh, you're not going to get those on your own. So if you're a business owner using PPP, I'd make it part of your regimen to check uh, the SBA site every day as these more technical rules are uh, put forward. Thank you. Are there, are there any more? We're about two minutes to two. And I, I think um, I, 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 both of our speakers, I know, need to, need to wrap up, as do many of our citizens. I do have a quick question as to the, uh, the SBA loans. I'm thinking ahead and I'm wondering, will they be bundled and sold on the secondary market in the future? Well, idle loans wouldn't be sold, um, but uh, PPP loans could be sold. Um, I don't know whether a lot of lenders will sell them. Um, it doesn't make it doesn't seem like it would make a ton of sense to me that they will sell them, but maybe, especially if the the lender doesn't have a lot of capital and they've made a lot of them. Right. Maybe Tom would have a better perspective on this. I know it's possible to sell a PPP, but I'm not sure if it will be sold. Yeah, I think uh, the law permits uh, the sale of those loans to the secondary market, which I would also presume the servicing uh, sale as well. So I think that's probably the, 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 the root of the concern. 
Um, it's been three weeks in. I've not seen a secondary market uh, inquiry yet emerge. Uh, a lot of other SBA loans through the 7A program traditionally in 504B do have a very robust secondary market. The spreads and premiums in those are uh, sometimes attractive to investors. I'm not sure on this one that that's the case given the short duration of the life of the loan being in, in aggregate less than 24 months and the effective interest rate being 1% on it. Um, so I think most banks that are investing in this uh, view the SBA program ultimately as a way to help our local communities and reinforce existing relationships. And as an investment, um, looking at a two-year bond out there, anything that's got a positive return with zero risk on it um, is a good bet these days. And I, my hunch is few institutions would sell them into the secondary market, but that's only my conjecture at the moment. That's the way I'm looking at it, that um, these are short-term short -term loans with modest, uh, modest spread on it, and there's probably not a lot of demand for these in the secondary market. Uh, they, are, they are relatively labor-intensive given the amount of interaction that all the businesses will have with their banks in a relatively short period. Okay, thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Well, Tom and wow, Ray, great question. <laughs> great question. Well, Tom and Ray, we want to thank you so much for your time. It's two o'clock, and uh, our session needs to come to a close. And to all of our citizens, we want to say thank you so much for joining us today. This is our second call, and uh, we hope we told you something you did not know. We hope that we uh, it gave you some information that you can use. And uh, most of all, we hope that you invested time that was um, definitely well spent. So um, we are going to work with our economic development team in the city to uh, send you a survey. We hope that you'll give us some candid feedback because uh, what's most important is that um, we are working uh, to make certain that uh, we're providing value to you. And um, we, we tried this because this is our second, this is our second uh, initiative and uh, we wanna make certain that um, we could um, offer you something during this time that um, it really, it, that can really help you in your business and your family. So um, on that note, um, you can always contact anyone here on the committee and anyone here at the city. We thank our mayor and everyone here for helping us host this today. And again, to all of our guests, uh, we have a little something for you that'll be mailed out on behalf of the city and to all of our citizens, stay safe. And thank you so much for your support and we will be in touch. Thanks everyone and have a good day. All right, bye-bye.